Okay, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gents, I got a problem that I have to take care of right now because my headset, the volume is going to be messed up because I don't have it plugged in because I've been using it all day and I haven't been charging it. So I apologize for that mismatch noise that I just did with y'all. But I had to plug it in because if I don't plug it in, we're going to have some problems. Because then I'm going to have to switch. Stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. Sorry, I have a desk and it's very touchy. When I touch it, it goes down. And it ain't supposed to be going down because, you know, um, Rose Royce ain't here no more. And, 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 and my girl... Uh, 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 you know who she is, my girl. She she be like, uh, no more drama. Mm -hmm. She be, she be like, I'm going down, and I tell her you can't be going down. You gotta go up. You gotta just keep on moving up, like to the top, and, and keep rising, like like Dougie Fresh said. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I am finished with all of my connections and plugging things up and charging batteries and all of that. What we need to talk about is important. Do you see what's in front of you? This is a motion for summary judgment template that I'm providing for you guys. And this is a memorandum of court cases. Court concurring opinion for what we're writing. So let's do some talking. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we created a folder. It's inside the mortgage complaint and case law, number eight. Mortgage complaint and case law, summary judgment and proposed order. So the summary judgment template has a proposed order. Do yourself a favor. Do like I did. Get yourself Natural Reader. Just go and download Natural Reader, copy and paste it in here, and listen to it. I promise you, you're going to love this order, especially when the order gets to, let me, let me get there, okay? I'll see you when you get there. See you when, see you when you get there. See you when you get there. Okay, we're going to start with the summary judgment standard. So let's see. And it might take a second because I'm sharing the screen with the recorder and I'm talking and I'm using the audio. So it might take a second for it to catch up to me. Okay, so give it a second because it took a second for me. So I'm going to pause y'all for a second. Summary judgment pursuant to Rule 56 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure may be employed in a lien foreclosure. For Merton's Law of Fed. Hold on. That's Ryan. And I, Ryan shouldn't be talking like that. So let's see if we can undo that. And Income tax in paragraph 49E, 55, 2013. Come on now. Summary judgment is appropriate where there is no genuine issue of material fact and dispute and the movement is entitled to judgment as a matter of law. CFED. RCIV. P56A. See also Salotex Corporation v. Catret. 477 U.S. 317, 322, 1986. The movement bears the burden of establishing the absence of a material factual dispute and, in making this assessment, the court views all facts and ambiguities in the record in the light most favorable to the non-movement. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, when you'll find, what you will find when you go over this document, you will find that most of the comments are exactly what the courts have said. All we did was what we found the cases, and we're using the court's own words. We, we are not using our words. We're acting as a, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. What, what, uh, the reason why I'm showing you the thing about summary judgment, because I want to tell you, those of you who don't understand, I'm going to show it to you. When I say I'm a genius, I am not the genius. It's, I have a God that I trust. And I go to him and I, 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 we have conversations. He knows what's important to me. And he knows that I'm stressed about you guys. And so remember, I asked about you all. Didn't ask about myself. Just, I don't have a mortgage! I apologize. I don't have a mortgage, ladies and gentlemen. So this doesn't benefit me. I had two consults this week, and they were both about mortgages. It's based on those consults that this is being created. Let me do the first thing to let you know. Who else have you had doing foreclosures that told you about doing a summary judgment against a financial institution? 
Okay. Now, if they told you to do this, if they tell you to do it because it was not a secured loan, because you did not own the collateral, and then they provide you proof and memorandum of law supporting that doctor. Well, ladies and gentlemen, not only did I do that, but I also put in the information about Fair Debt Collections Practice Act. Did you know that the courts have ruled the following? Let's see. I don't want that part. That's not the Fair Debt Collections Practice Act. Let's see if I have it. Verified Debt Sworn Declaration. That's the one. That's the one. You know how we, we've been telling you guys that a sworn declaration must be under penalty of perjury? That, that's what a sworn, sworn declaration is supposed to be? Well, let me show you what the courts have said, because you're going to find out what's going on. See, look, furthermore, homie belief that validation requires a disclosure of a signed loan agreement, a sworn accounting ledger, and an affidavit attesting to the current status of the validity of the debt. It's grossly overstated, and it is, because the verification doesn't require all of that. But hold on. To sufficiently validate a debt, a debt collector need only demonstrate that the creditor has provided some evidence <clears throat> has provided some evidence that the debtor owes the specific amount demanded. Really? Is, is that what the law requires? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to suggest we go and we check out the law. Oh, this ain't it. That's tax return stuff. This ain't, oh, this is verification, but these are the two definitions. We'll talk about the definitions later. I don't want the definitions. What I want to show you is the actual act. So we're going to have to go back one more gear. Now, this is going to be another defamination, but we don't want a defamination because defamination is going to get people in trouble. Okay? So pay attention, ladies and gentlemen. We don't care about none of this because they say verification only requires that they provide you a brief statement. <clears throat> Pay attention. Verification only requires that a debt collector provides you a brief statement. A statement that, a statement that, a statement that. So we can prove, pay attention, that verification and statement are not the same thing. The courts are saying it is the same thing. However, a statement that unless you dispute the validity. Okay, so they say all they need to do is provide you the name and address of the creditor. Wait, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm about to tell you how to cancel this stupidity. You see, it says provide the consumer with the name and address of the original creditor if different from the current creditor. Hold on. That only happens if the consumer requests such. If the consumer requests the name and address of the creditor in writing, then they're to provide that information. Hold on. Let's find out what they're supposed to really provide. Do you mind? Dispute of debt. If the consumer notifies the creditor within 30 days in writing, period, described in Section A, that the debt or portion thereof is in dispute, or that the consumer requests the name and address of the original creditor. The debt collector shall cease collection of the debt. That is an absolute. That's a cease and desist order. And any disputed portion thereof, it's an automatic cease and desist order until the debtor obtains verification. Until, uh, uh, um, until the debtor obtains, or the debt collector, sorry, verification. So they have to get it from somebody else, but it's not a statement that they are getting. No, they're not getting a statement. They're getting verification. Ladies and gentlemen, I am so sorry to announce to you that the courts have said that there is no definition in the statute for verification. See, Jeffrey alleges that validation of the debt, response style of the verification of debt, but fails to meet the legal definition of verification, which should be one under oath or sworn to verification of debt involves nothing more than a debt collector confirming in writing the amount being demanded is what the creditor is claiming is owed that is not what verification means it never meant that ladies and gentlemen but the fact that it says that the fdcpa does not contain a requirement that the verification of a debt be under oath in an affidavit position why because they say there's no definition for verification Okay, they say it though, there's no definition. 
So how do you get around that? How do you get around there's no definition of verification? Hold on, we're going to go to one more. Y'all just hold on, because a lot of people, these cases right here, 1960 and everything else, people have been bringing up this argument from a long time. And they're just telling them, hey, guys, <laughs> y'all ain't got nothing coming. Because they're bringing up a presumption, ladies and gentlemen. The court is raising a presumption, although the court should not be raising any presumption. It should not be taking any position other than facts and conclusion of law. Courts do not rely on facts. They rely on presumptions. Okay? So because the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act does not define what verification is, okay, does not define what verification is. It says then they have to go by what they normally do. Ladies and gentlemen, is that true? If they don't have a definition, what, what do we do? Well, I'm going to show you. I'm looking for the other one underneath this junk when it talks about verification of debt. Because when you do a verified document, it has to be under oath or affirmation. Now, look, it says, or the following statement, so you don't need to use under penalty of perjury. That's why I put under penalty of divine retribution, if not, if otherwise. On your documents, I don't put under penalty of divine retribution. I just put under penalty. Okay, that's it. You can determine what the penalty is. Okay, just that simple. So we're not going to do verification of document because that's different. Okay, because that does require uh, you to do it under penalty, under some type of sworn statement. Okay. However, the courts have made it quite clear that the FDCPA does not. Uh, the question whether the document provides a verification satisfies any rules of evidence is not relevant to whether or not the FDCPA violations other courts have concluded that computer printout constitutes verification. A computer printout does not constitute verification. A computer printout, anybody can print out a computer. That's not a validation. That's just a simple statement. We didn't ask for a statement. The statute itself defines that statement and verification are not the same thing. That's why they're in the same paragraph, two different words. They are not the same thing, people. So the court wants you to play these games with them. Don't play the games. Use their own language against them. You have case text. See, I'm telling you, case text, uh, the gentleman who told me about case text, I, I've seen case text before, but I didn't know because I didn't use it, use it, use it. But when I went there and I started using case text, I'm like, what the flying, you know, fart, frank, fart, and you know what I'm saying? So let me tell you about the court and verification, if you don't mind. See, in absence of a statutory definition, the common and generally understood meaning of a word should be applied in the construction of the statute. So guess what, ladies and gentlemen? If verification is not defined in the statute, then, and I did look in that statute, I went and I did a word search, and verification is not there. So guess what? When a word is not defined in the statute, the court normally, the courts normally construed it in accordance with the ordinary and natural meaning. So let me show you something, ladies and gentlemen. We're going we're gonna to go down a little bit more. Time on my hands since I've been awake, girl. But I ain't got no plans. No, 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 no. I got to find it. I know I may have already passed it up, but. Oh, this is the Debt Collection section right here. For Debt Collection is Practice Act. So there are two things that you guys need to understand. Do some research on a pre-acquired collateral. There is no such thing when it comes to the Fair Debt Collection Practice Act. You're not allowed to pre-acquire collateral. Uh, as I said in the last video, let your yes mean yes, you no, no, because you cannot turn one hair white, black, green, or brown. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it works out like this. You cannot promise collateral that you have no rights to, that you hope to have rights to. Nobody's going to take your promise or your word for the fact that you're going to have something. Go ahead. Try to let somebody borrow money from you and tell you, I mean, I'm going to pay you back pay you back in five minutes, all right? All right.
let's go with the fair debt collection practice side. We're going to start with verification. I'm going to let you guys hear what I wrote. Tracy, C. Calabi, Prudential Residential Services, LP, 22 F.3D 1219, 1223, Second Circle. Uh-uh. That ain't where we're supposed to be. Hold on. Uh-uh. I didn't tell you to go there. We're going to start here, okay? That's where we're going to be. Hold on. I, I, she, sometimes she acts up, y'all. Uh-oh. By its very terms, this standard provides that the mere existence of some alleged factual dispute between the parties will not... Yeah, it's, it's wrong, ladies and gentlemen. I gotta get her to wake up. So come on, Tracy. You're gonna start here. That's where I want you. Eight. The Fair Debt Collection Practices Act does not supply a definition for verification, and it is a settled rule of construction that where a term employed in the statute is not therein defined. The term must be given its ordinary, plain and generally accepted meaning. Crane v. Commissioner, oh. 331 U.S. 1, 6, 67 S. Court 1047, 91 L. Ed. Let's go here. We're going to make this skip all that. Ain't no need to be doing all that to Come on now, Tracy. 9. Our sister courts have held that. Verification. When filing an action for foreclosure on a mortgage for residential real property, the claim for relief shall be verified by the claimant seeking to foreclose the mortgage. When verification of a document is required, the document filed shall include an oath, affirmation, or the following statement. Under penalties of perjury, I declare that I have read the foregoing. And the okay. facts alleged. We, we already know that, Tracy. Go to the next statement. Sorry, Tracy. We don't need to know all that. We and the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act makes the following statement to debt collectors. If, within the 30-day period, the consumer disputes in writing any portion of the debt or requests the name and address of the original creditor. The collector must stop all collection efforts until he or she mails the consumer a copy of a judgment or verification of the debt or the name and address of the original creditor. Creditor must stop all collection efforts until he or she mails the consumer a copy of the judgment or verification of the debt and the name and address and, or the name and address of the original creditor, if applicable. Ladies and gentlemen, I copied that straight from the so-called act. Let me put Tracy on hold so I can let you guys know what's going on because she's going to take too long. Y'all hear her? She's taking coffee breaks and everything. You know she smokes, okay? And I've been trying to get her to quit, but she, she likes stuff. Anyway, all right, the statement, the collector must stop all collection efforts until he or she mails a consumer a copy of the judgment or verification of the debt. Taken into context, implies that a judgment of the court need not contain a, the seal of the court. If we were to suggest that verification and a judgment of the court are not to be synonymous. Well, because see, ladies and gentlemen, you guys need to see what's synonymous here. You see, it says specifically, it says specifically, ladies and gentlemen, that the individual can request verification. I'm looking for not the app oath or affirmation. I got to go back to verification uh, in the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. So let's find out. Where are, request the name and address, okay, because it says it's applicable. So I'm looking for the thing that says, want to suggest that verification and a judgment of a court are not synonymous. You see, if you're going to get verification of the debt or a judgment from the court, if it was a judgment for the court, you have the right to get that court judgment on certified document. You have a right to get the verification certified as well. That's what it means by it would be to suggest if it just meant that it was supposed to not contain a seal or anything, that verification and statements and name and address 
that that's all they do is provide you general information. This is not general information. For the statement is clear that the name and address of the original creditor specifically states, if applicable, in the context of request the name and address of the original creditor, which implies that the debtor would have to request that information specifically for that to be applicable. Okay, so we will revert to the ordinary meaning of the statute in the context in which the statute is written. The statute states, a statement that, and then number four says, a statement that, and number five says, a statement that, as I just showed you earlier. And that section B of the code, it makes the following statement. Until the debt collector obtains verification of the debt or a copy of a judgment or the name and address of the original creditor and a copy of such verification or judgment. See, that's the statement. Verification or judgment, meaning that these two are synonymous. A judgment must be certified. You can't just give somebody a copy of a judgment. You must give them a certified copy or a sealed copy. Uh, what is that thing called? Where the court certified, but it's not actually called certified. But anyway, you need to get an abstract or something like that from the court. Okay. Or name and address of the original creditor. Okay. So what we say there is... Because the section mentions verification and doesn't mention statement anywhere in here or judgment that when it says verification, it's not meaning a statement. Because two different words being used by the, what you call it, uh, Congress, the legislature. The statement, until the debt collector obtains verification of the debt and a copy of such verification, suggests that some random statement from a creditor will not suffice to satisfy the conditions of the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act. That verification in this context means that the creditor must actually obtain the from the original creditor verification of the debt. This verification requirement requires the court to employ the definition of the word verification in the context in which Congress intended. The definition for verification is as follows. Black's Law Dictionary, second edition, in pleading, a certain formula which will, uh, me, which all pleadings containing new affirmative matters must conclude being in itself an averment of a party pleading is ready to establish the truth of what he has set forth. Ladies and gentlemen, the people who are involved in the Penny Mac case with me and the other cases see that every time I conclude a document, I include a verification. And I include verification and validation at the very end of all the documents. You'll see the same thing is done at the end of this document. Okay, well, uh, case in point. Let's give it to you. Okay, that's the order section. Here's the verification and validation section. Again, you will take this document, you will get it signed by a notary. If you're going through foreclosure now, download this document, you're going to need it. Get it signed by a notary. Why? Because this is a Declaration for Summary Judgment under Rule 56 in federal court. You can amend it and put it into state court if you want. It is it is subject to having you amend it for state court. You just have to get rid of pursuant to federal Rule 56. And you'll have to get rid of the in the federal district court and you'll have to put it in your state court. But this is capable of being filed in your state court. That's why it was done this way. Ladies and gentlemen, the first thing this does is it lets them know that there's a misapplication of the non-judicial foreclosure act. That's what you're bringing a claim against. It's technically a wrongful foreclosure petition. And this is a petition uh, supported by verified affidavit. That's why you're getting it notarized, ladies and gentlemen. It becomes evidence. Now look. I ask for the patience of the court, as I am not a learned person and not an admission person, nor a member of the craft. I do not know the proper procedures and aim to do my best in articulating the issues presented to be as specific as possible and not reach conclusions unless quoting members of Congress or the courts. 
I will avoid making statements as to facts not supported by quoting members of Congress or the court. Basically, you're telling them, hey, here, 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 you morons, this is what you guys have been asking us to do, but we're going to use your word. You want us to put that in, then go ahead and tell us that this is frivolous. Go ahead and tell us this is gobbledygook, because then we will have proof from that point on that your junk that you'll be spilling out is frivolous, meritless, and gobbledygook. Because every statement we have made, we've supported it by conclusions of your law, which is your case so-called law. Yeah, I know I'm cursing. I apologize, y'all. Again, this whole thing is talking about collateral. The whole premise is they're doing a foreclosure on your property because your property is secured by collateral. It's called a mortgage. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we put the information in here that it is not a mortgage as defined in statute. Your property is not a mortgage. It is not a secured debt as defined in statute. And we put the statute throughout. This whole document, including the order, uh, proposed order of the court, 45 pages long. This is taking me over 12 straight hours. And when I say 12 straight hours, two days, 12 straight hours total in putting this together. Under standard property law, in contrast, dwellings in general, like land in which they are attached, fall into the category of real property that is termed as commonly as property law. Ladies and gentlemen, let me make sure you understand. Your property is not real property. Your property is not real estate. Stop using that term. Your property is private property. It is not real estate because it is not commercial property. Real estate has its own definition, but private property under the Uniform Commercial Code, as we put right here, is exempt from their regulations. They cannot regulate your property. They cannot statutorize your property. Don't go in there saying that. Uh-uh, everything is said in this document using their words, not yours. So don't go repeating what I'm saying, y'all. Because a mortgage is construed as a debt collection activity under the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, I do bring forth the fact that I am just now being made aware of this, and I have the right to dispute the debt formally. I have demanded verification of debt as the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act and the Fair Credit Reporting Act requires that the debt be verified upon request and that the creditor has 30 days to provide such verification and must cease and assist any and all debt attempts to collect the debt until such verification is provided. The verification implies a sworn declaration. I have received no such sworn declaration despite the fact that I have formally disputed the debt and do so continuously. I have not received proper verification as required by statute, which is a violation of my rights and chargeable and sanctionable. Mortgage foreclosure is a debt collection activity. Pay attention. Foreclosure proceedings are deemed debt collection activity. Whoa, wait, wait, wait. I thought they said it wasn't a debt collection activity. Some courts have said it's not a debt collection activity. So notice what we do. Foreclosure meets the broad definition of debt collection activities under the FDCPA. Foreclosure, although legal in nature, is activity undertaken for the general purpose of inducing payment, i.e. debt collection activity. A debt collector cannot avoid the FDCPA liability simply by proceeding in rem rather than in personam. In rem means non-judicial. Now, here is the genius, thank you, my God, the one that I serve, for helping me to understand this. I told you guys yesterday about coming up with the idea while doing the consult of a summary judgment and going into the court on summary judgment. I just didn't know how to go into court on summary then I found the case law that says that foreclosure is a summary judgment proceeding to begin with. Foreclosure is summary judgment to begin with. So here is the thing. If they can do it, you can do it. That's what I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen. Guess what they need? They, they be filing these summary judgments, be requesting summary judgment of foreclosure because when you go into court, and you that's why they don't let you say nothing because you just there to say that it ain't no debt and to prove that it ain't no debt. Well, no, you ain't going in there proving that it ain't no debt. You agreeing that there's a debt. You don't want there to be no dispute. You don't want there to be no controversy. Uh -uh, there is a debt. I agree. No, I just am pointing out that the law says that this ain't a secured debt. 
That's right. This is a personal loan. I didn't go there to buy a home. I went there to get a loan so that I could purchase a home. And here is the proof. So you must include. Pay, 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 pay attention. You must include a copy of the seller's information showing that you purchased the cop, uh, property from a seller. Now, it doesn't matter if you refinance. You're going after the original creditor. Pay attention. The original creditor. Refinance is not the original creditor. They paid the original credit. That means that money is owed to you if that original creditor didn't have a secured debt and they tried to foreclose on you before and you refinance and you modify. Okay? Fraud, fraud, fraud. We bring up the claim of fraud. We bring up elements of fraud. We show that you've been damaged. We show that you've been harmed. We put all of that in this document. Every aspect that are needed to be proved in law is in the document. You don't have to add nothing. Now, I'm going to suggest you add the property address and all of that stuff. Oh, and by the way, the order has to be on its own separate set of pages, so it cannot be included on the notary page. Just that simple. Got to say that to you. Ladies and gentlemen, you're going to include proof of the prior owner. You're going to include proof that you, your name is on the property. Why? Because if you purchase the property from a prior owner, there is no way in the world the property can be a secured loan. That's what your argument is. If you purchase it from the bank, then it's a secured loan. Now, if you refinance, it's a secured loan, but you're going after the original mortgage owner, the original mortgage, or the I'm not mortgage or mortgagee, the bank. You're going after them. Why are you going after them? Because they said that your loan was a secured loan and that your home was collateral. You could not have put your home up as collateral. We put the case law in here. That's why you see the word collateral all throughout here. You're going to see all of the case law associated with your private property and collateral. Pay attention, I didn't write this. Was purchased for private use, household goods, consumer goods, not for profit or for gain, and is not associated with the loan provided by the financial institution and in initiating the loan. Consistent with the basic principles of conveyance, the borrower must have obtained some interest in the collateral. And I gotta see, yeah, I'll leave the, the collateral, I'll leave that alone because these are the words of the court in order to transfer the interest to the lender. And this is the case right here, Second Circuit. Notwithstanding any agreement between the debtor and the creditor, any other subsequent agreement, the debtor has no right, the debtor, the debtor has no right to the collateral. No security interest in that collateral comes into existence. So you could not create a security interest if you had no rights to the collateral in the first instance. That's what this is saying. Ladies and gentlemen, I promise you, I guarantee you that I could not have done better. I'm not keeping this to myself. I know so many other people, they would keep this to themselves. They would hide this. They wouldn't let anybody else know. I'm sharing this with all of you. I'm telling you that this document needs to be sent to the court. You need to provide information concerning the debt. Read over it. Let Tracy or Mike or Dave or any of them Speak it back to you so you can know what the document says. Okay? But you need to provide proof. Pay attention to what I'm saying. That there was a prior owner. Because if there's a prior owner, that means that you had no rights to the collateral. That makes it an unsecured debt. Not a mortgage. It cannot be a mortgage. A mortgage is a property secured by collateral. It cannot be a mortgage. So if it's not a mortgage, the Non-Judicial Foreclosure Act cannot apply because the Non-Judicial Foreclosure Act, it appears that reference to a loan was not a secured mortgage loan. So it is not a secured mortgage loan. My loan does not appear to qualify as a mortgage loan. And here is section 1602A8, expressly excludes residential mortgage loan. Well, it doesn't exclude you because your loan was not a mortgage loan. You can use the Truth in Lending Act, but do you know that the Truth in Lending Act specifically says this? A mortgage referred to in this section means a consumer credit transaction that is secured by the consumer's principal dwelling other than a residential mortgage transaction. So yours is not a residential mortgage transaction or a consumer credit transaction. Yours is just a basic personal loan. That's it. That's it. And then you bring up the violation of the Truth in Lending Act and all this. Now, why do you do all of that? 
I'm not trying to go over the whole document, but I'm trying to go over the particulars of the document so you'll know what's going on. You do all of that because the court is issuing an order. So you do a proposed order. Don't change the proposed order, people. Don't be stupid. Please. Please, 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 please. You only bring up the violations of the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, Fair Credit Consumer Act. The court finds no reason nor justification in departing from the rule in this instance in verification. Verification does imply that the debt collector received from original creditor verification of the alleged debt. And until such time as verification is applied, the debt collector is prohibited from moving forward on the collection of the debt. The implications here is that more is necessary that a simple uh, it's supposed to be then a simple statement, so sorry. From a debt collector stating, yes, you owe us money. For the act specifically states that they must notify the original creditor and receive verification of the from the original creditor. Because the term statement is utilized throughout the act, verification and statement are nowhere there indicated as being synonymous. So verification must carry the ordinary meaning, as is the custom of the court. The ordinary meaning of verification implies a sworn declaration or affidavit, even a complaint filed, excuse me, filed in the court must be verified with a sworn declaration or an affidavit. And there is no evidence before the court that the creditor has complied with the requirements of the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. Fair Debt Collection Practices Act permits and allows the court to assign section sanctions of $1,000 for each violation. Pay attention, please. The petitioner has demonstrated, documented, several attempts to communicate with the creditor in disputing the debt. So you have to attach the QWR, and you have to attach your some of your communication. You have to attach all of the communication. You have to attach something saying you were disputing the debt. That's all I need you to do. Since the act says that the creditor has 30 days to supply a sworn verification, to date the creditor has failed to provide that information, and that this matter appears to be have been outstanding for more than 30 months, this equates to $30,000 because uh, $1,000 a month. So 1,000 times 30 is $30,000. Unless the parties provide information disputing that figure to access the creditor immediately. The creditor was supposed to provide such information. And until it provided that information, was commanded by statute to cease and assist all debt collection activities and practices associated with the account. It is perceived that the debt collector failed to follow the dictates of the statute and for violations thereof is assessed the same $1,000 per violation per 30 days, amounting to 30 months, equating to $30,000, for which the creditor is obligated to the petitioner and is hereby ordered to offset the debt it claims is owed and the, in the petitioner's favor in a total amount of $60,000 to be applied to the principal of the account. You don't have to change those numbers. God, so many of you are going to be so, I'm sorry. I apologize, ladies and gentlemen. There are going to be so many greedy, greedy and selfish people who are going to take this document and kill it by coming up. The law only permits you $1,000 per violation. Instead of you having to sit up there, we've already talked about the violations in the complaint. Instead of you sitting up there nitpicking, if you offset it by $60,000, ladies and gentlemen, that pays you up for the last couple of years. Now you've got time to prepare and you can go ahead and put in another motion and get it corrected. And get mo. I don't care. This is not a lawsuit. God, this is a summary judgment request. They're going to deny it. So don't mess with it because there is more to it, ladies and gentlemen. We know they're going to deny it and you're going to appeal it. Remember, this is just for summary judgment. It's only $47 to file for summary judgment in the federal court. The state court is roughly the same. You're spending about $50,000 to save your, I mean, $50 to save your home. $50. So stop being greedy. Just follow the procedure. God. This is a process that I'm putting together. So stop thinking that you know more than I do. Because if you did, look at the logic, people. If you knew more than I did, you would have done this already. You wouldn't be watching my videos. You wouldn't be trying to, oh, look, I'm going to try that out. Okay, stop it. 
I've been sitting up here all day trying to work on this, and I know some of you are going to be ignorant. And if you mess this up, do not contact me. I got people contacting me right now asking me to help them with their own personal stuff. I am not your personal helper. That's what the consults are for. If you can't afford the consulting, you can't afford my time. So stop asking me for personal favors to help you with your personal es I'm sorry. Whew. Lord have mercy. That's how tired I am. For violations of the Credit Reporting Act, since the debt collector is acting as a creditor of a debt reported to the credit reporting bureaus at current for Enovis, TransUnion, Experion, and Equifax. Since the documenting of a default or the delinquency of payment after request was made requiring a sworn verification of the debt, assuming without any evidence to the contrary that this has continued for the past 30 months with the exception of 45 days. Now let me let me stop all of you so that you understand why that is because many of you will not have equated for 45 days. You don't start receiving a notice of a delinquent debt that you missed the payment until 45 days. So Assuming that they notified you that you missed the payment and you said, I need you to validate this debt. That's what we're assuming. And there's no evidence to the contrary that you did that. We take away 45 days. So we rough it out to 28 months because 45 days is a month and a half. 30 months, take away a month and a half. That brings you to 28 and a half months. We give another 15 days just in good faith. So we take you to 28 months. You multiply 28 months. By 30, you get 112. Now, that's basically you multiply the amount of time, 30 months, by $1,000. And what do you get? Well, if you multiply 30 months by $1,000, that's $30,000. Now, you got to take 30 times 4. 30 times 4 gives you 120. Now, you got to subtract those two months per each 30 months which gives you how many? Two times four is eight. So 120 minus eight is 112. Get the math already. So don't put the system. I apologize. I just wanted to let you guys know how we assess all of the amounts. And we are talking about having them offset the balance between what the two are claiming is owed. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what I want you to do. When you appeal this, this is the genius, I promise you. Those of you who don't know how to do an appeal, you just need to, uh, if you're going to file this in a federal court, you need to download the cover sheet for the court, and you need to file the cover sheet with it. And then you need to deposit the monies for the filing fee. Okay, understand, when you want to put this in the appeals court, you get rid of this. This thing about declaratory judgment, judicial intervention, and all that, and you get rid of all that. And you just put notice of appeal. You do one document, and you just one page, just the page. All this notice of appeal, and in the middle you put notice of appeal, and then you do your verification and validation statement and sign it. And then on this document, you get rid of this, you amend it, and you say appeal brief. And you all the same information in your appeal brief. Just that simple. Just that simple, because you're using the case law. Ain't no need. Now, if you got to say, I disagree with the court for the following reasons, then that's what you do. I disagree with the court for the following reasons. The court made an error. The court made a mistake. Okay, that's it. That's your appeal. It's already done for you. You don't have to do nothing. You don't have to add nothing. It's all done. Designed this way purposely to help as many of you as possible. So just follow, follow the rules. Some of you are going to think you're smarter than me. I promise you. Because I can, I can see it, I can hear it. I mean, I, I'm even listening to you now. I see your heads turning and twisting. I see the smoke coming out of some of your heads because you're thinking about what you can add to this. And I'm going to add this and I'm going to add that. And why would you do that? Why would you add all that stupid stuff? This ain't got nothing to do with it. This is all about their procedures. This is following their procedures purposely and intentionally so that if they deny it, it's based on their procedures. But if you add all that junk, they're going to deny it because of your junk. 
You see, you want them to say that they've been wrong all this time. So let them say that they're wrong. Let them say that their case law is wrong. I need you to follow procedures so I can go to the Supreme Court and document to the Supreme Court that these courts don't know what they're doing. They're all over the place, making decisions and being technical. Oh, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, most of the people who have been losing these cases that I've been looking at the case law, it's because the courts have been getting technical, calling it a mortgage loan, calling it a um, credit transaction, giving all of these stupid little names instead of calling it what it is. So what I put in here is you're telling the court, hey, look, I'm not, I'm not a legal scholar. This is not about this. This is not about that. It's only about this. And then I bring it all the way back home at the end. And that's what this document is for. This is to be done, and again, to be sent to the court along with, oh, come on, this document right here about the clerk of the court. Now, somebody decided to send me a bunch of information on the Chris system. I wish they'd pay attention to the videos. I already know about the Chris system. That's why it's in my documents. I'm the one doing videos on the Chris system. And then there was another person sending me photos and everything of their family situation. It's not my job. I'm not here. I'm not your social worker. I'm not here to take care of your family situation. All right? You guys want help with some personal junk? That's a consult. Already the two people I've done a consult with this week, I've already spent more than seven hours helping them on telephone calls. This is me waking up and going to sleep doing this stuff. So, yes, I am stressing because I'm trying to help all of you, and some of you are not being cooperative. Some of you are being selfish. And, yes, I'm going to call you selfish, and I'm not going to hold my tongue. Selfish, 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 because you're only interested in one thing, you. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't have time for selfish people. Go ahead and look at one thing that I've done that's been selfish. Go ahead, point it out in your ignorance, those who want to try Point it out. As I said in the video yesterday, I had a gentleman who called me. Um, he was supposed to call me today. I gave him my number and everything to call me, and I haven't heard from him. I also had somebody known as Mr. Cooper call me today. And I tried to find out, talking about sending three packages. I believe it was the gentleman who was trying to send us some junk to our uh, our company address. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't get to send us nothing unless we give you instructions to send us something. We've already made that quite clear. We do everything electronically. You can't just send us anything just to be sending us anything. We do everything electronically because under each one of our emails, each one of our communications, it specifically has an arbitration clause. Because we don't want nobody trying to serve nothing stupid on us, thinking that you're going to bind us into some stupid contract. We, we are beyond that. All right. I apologize, ladies and gentlemen. You're going to send this to the attorney general of your state. You're going to send it to the district attorney of your state. Not the, not the complaint to the court. Okay? This summary judgment goes to the court. You're going to send a copy of this to the court and all the attachments to the court, which should have that proof that there was a prior owner. You're going to send all of that to the court. It's going to be attached to this so that there can be no argument. You're not arguing that there is not a deed of trust. You're not arguing that the deed of trust is fraudulent. You're not arguing any of those points. You're not arguing that there's no debt. You're not arguing that. You're not conceding that there's a debt. You're saying that the deed of trust seems to evidence a debt. No, what you're saying is, but this is not a secured debt. You can't use the non-judicial foreclosure act in this because it's not a mortgage either. This is not a debt secured by a mortgage because you didn't own any collateral at the time that you got the loan. And you bring about the fact that they set up there and would not give you possession of your property until you signed your property over as collateral. It's okay. Don't worry about that because it's not a secured debt as defined in statute. And that's what this is about. And so, as you can see, as I showed you earlier, it's already online. It's under the mortgage complaint form. Now, I didn't put the mortgage complaint form here. And the reason why I didn't put the mortgage complaint form is because it's already in the first page. So when you click on the mortgage complaint form, and you won't have a screen like this, okay? 
But when you click on the Morgan's Complaint form, it's right there. Morgan's Fraud Complaint of Alleged Criminal Conduct. That's the form right there. So there's no need for me to put it in the summary judgment once it's on the same page. And because the only reason, uh-oh, I, I was, it was letting me know that it was trying to get to the site. Because this is the actual website. So this is me showing you that the documents are up online. If I put it here, there are videos that are done to where the link is to that file. So no, I don't want to put it in this folder and I don't want to have two up. We have too many documents that are already duplicated. So there you go. Ladies and gentlemen, as I said, I know for a fact most people who would have done something like this, these individuals would have charged you or they would have made a profit and they would have shared it with everyone else. So before anybody and their grandfather makes any comment negatively about me, go and see if anybody else is doing what I'm doing. Go ahead. And then go and see if anybody's doing what I'm doing with the ability of tapping into the knowledge that I have. The ability of tapping into it. Go ahead, I dare you. And then go and see if they're doing it for people for free. When I tell you my time is valuable, you don't get to determine whether or not I, well, I was trying not to interrupt you. Don't worry about my time. I'm a grown man. If I'm busy, I'll tell you I'm busy. But when people call me, then I answer my phone. Do not call me on Sundays. Sundays is my day. And I heard you say, why they diss me like that? I should have repented. Somebody should have said that special letters are magnificent. I am the magnificent. Sorry. Anyway, Sunday is my day. Okay. So stay out of my day. Just that simple. I'm not doing none of your business on my day. Now, if I call you on that day and you want to talk and I call you, then you're free to talk. But you are not going to be having me answer my phone on that day. Just got to let you know. Now, look, it's been a long day. It is 8 o'clock. I got up this morning at 6.30. I've been in front of this computer since 7 o'clock. Okay, that is 13 hours today. Plus, oh, 14 hours yesterday. I just don't have the energy, but I'm giving you guys all the energy I can. I had a headache so bad last night that I was dizzy when I got up from this computer last night. It ain't because of looking at the screen, so stop thinking that. I was dizzy because of the level of fatigue. Okay, I am getting sleep. I am getting rest. I am getting at least seven hours of sleep a night. Okay, that, that is happening. The only problem is I'm exhausted because I also have these wonderful little physical ailments that I have to deal with. And no, I don't want to try your remedies. No, do not make suggestions to me about health remedies. I don't want to hear it no more, people. God, I am in my, I've lived a half a century. So you can only imagine how many people are giving me health advice. So I'm going to give you my health advice. Take your middle finger, sit on it, and spin if you got to give me some health advice. Do that first, and do that until you are satisfied, and then you can come to me. No, I don't, I don't pull back a single word of what I just said. I am so sick and tired of people thinking that they are being helpful. I don't want your help with that area. That's my business. Stay up out of my business. Literally, that's, I mean what I just said. I am sick and tired. And then people are getting mad when I put them in their place about it. I don't care if you haven't heard me say it before. I don't care if you haven't listened to another video. That's your fault. You came to this channel. You should do your research first. Okay? There are all kinds of videos out there about me. Go ahead and listen to those first and then make your opinion from that jump. But if I was you, I'd go back and listen to the previous videos that were done on this side. You'll learn a lot because I, I will promise you, we're going to do about another three minutes, but I will promise all of you that I listen to my own videos and I guarantee you I learn from my own videos. There are a couple of videos right now that I want to go back and listen to. And you know what? I got some cooking to do. So there is a video that I'm going to listen to. And that video won't be this one. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, the video that I'm about to listen to, ladies and gentlemen, and the memorandum of law, the memorandum of law is done. It's up. So it's also on the very same site. But I'm going to go back and listen to the video about the information, the danger of the information. See, 
Uh, here's the memorandum of court concurring opinions. You're attaching that to your motion for a summary judgment. That's your evidence, ladies and gentlemen. That is your evidence. I had a judge, judge say that I could not use the Supreme Court as witnesses in a case. Of course I can use the court's opinion of witnesses. The court does it all the time. Of course, of course I can use case law to back up their own stupid junk or to back up my own statement. Of course I can do that. I didn't argue with the court. The court says a whole lot of stuff. The court operates on presumptions, ladies and gentlemen. They do not operate on facts. Pay attention. The court operates on presumptions, ladies and gentlemen. They do not operate on facts. So these documents rebut presumption. You don't have to add to the document to rebut presumptions because we take care of the foundational issues. Because we take care of the foundational issues, there's no reason for you to go to the top floor and try to take care of issues on the top floor. You clean the house from the floor on up, you ain't got to worry about the top floor. Okay? Because the top floor will get taken care of when you take care of the bottom floor. Why? Because you clean up the top, bottom floor, the top floor can't get dirty. Why? Ain't nobody able to bring nothing up there to make it dirty. The bottom floor is clean. What you going to track up to the top floor if the bottom floor is clean? Don't understand the logic. Don't sit up here and try to logic me because that, uh, that ain't possible. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for allowing me to bring this information to your attention. You have no idea how much I was stressing about having an interview to do this video for me. I've been able to muster it, and that's why I told you what I'm about to do is I'm about to. I've been watching the, uh, the Transformer Prime. Transformer Prime, I'm liking it. Okay, I, I, it came out in 2018. And I started to watch it, but uh, I just didn't feel like it. But now I'm watching and I'm all into it. I'm into like the 16th episode and I'm enjoying Transformer Prime. So that's what I watch to wind down to go to sleep. And here's the thing. I watch about three episodes and I can't stay up no more. So I have to shut everything down because I'm just too tired. But that's how I wind down. That's my uh, getting rid of all the stupidity and all the stress. So with that all being said, ladies and gentlemen, I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, when I say that I could not have done nothing better to help you with your mortgages than the mortgage complaint form and the summary judgment, when you read the order of the court, you will see that summary judgment is permissible. And because summary judgment is permissible, because foreclosure is only a summary judgment proceeding, and you're going into court doing a summary judgment instead of following a full lawsuit and having to follow fee waiver and go through all that stuff and let them dismiss it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, like I said, they will dismiss it. But in the process of them dismissing it, you will appeal. And you will ask for a stay pending appeal. And you will bring your appeal based on the fact that this information encompasses the general public. It affects many people. Especially, you bring up the thing about the uh, moratorium and how this information affects all of these people. And it will benefit all of these people. You will more than likely get your stay. Okay? Gotta go, ladies and gentlemen. I do hope that everything continues to work out with all of you. Please understand that the courts, every time you get a victory, the courts will figure out a technicality to take your victory away, including the appeals court. So what this document did was it went after those technicalities. That's what this document did. This document said, hey, we're going to kill all your technicalities. So if you want to get technical again, bring it. And then we're going to kill that one. And then we're going to leave you without those technicalities. So keep getting technical with people. And people like me will keep finding out why you ruled against that person when you know that that's not the law. Everybody who's losing cases, it is a technicality for which you're losing the case. And many of you are not able to hear it in the court's words. So that's why you have to rebut their presumptions at the very beginning. That's what this document does. I hope some of you realize that that's the case. We're not going to go to a full one hour. We're going to stop at uh, right about 59 minutes where we're at now. Ladies and gentlemen, I do ask that all of you have a very good weekend and a very good next week. I am going to, I have one more motion that I have to do. There are some people who have been scheduling and wanting to schedule consults. Please understand that I'm still giving people the hour and, well, I've been giving people a little bit more than an hour and a half lately. But I'm giving people an hour and a half at the beginning. There's no reason for me to split it up because I don't have that type of time. But they're getting my time. Now, most people are not seeing the value in the consoles at the beginning until they go back over the video. I'm literally trying to let you guys know 
pay attention to the information, record the call, record the call, record the call. If you by any chance get an opportunity to call me, record the call. Gotta go, y'all. It's one hour.